Our next speaker is uh, Brian Mullen, and will be talking to us about hook pods. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you said, my name is Brian Mullen. I'm going to be talking to you guys about another parasite. It's a uh, salmon cola californiensis, and it's uh, newly invasive to Lake Ontario. I'm also a master's student at SUNY Oneonta. So a little brief history on copepods. As many of you guys know, copepods are traditionally known as a uh, food source for fish. However, of the 13,000 known species of copepod, actually half of them are known to be parasitic. Um, the parasite that I'll be talking to you guys about today is from the family Larynchotidae. It's home to 68 genera of ectoparasites. Ectoparasites, um, they often have their transmission facilitated by the host and the movement of the host. So when the host itself is moved around, the parasite comes along with it. Copepod in question I'll be talking to you guys today about is Salmon Cola californiensis. It's an uh, ectoparasite that attaches to the gill of Ancrinchus salmonids, that's your coho, chinook, and steelhead salmon. And here we have a picture of the Salmon Cola species. This is a gravid female, as you can tell by the egg sacs right here. What's unique about this uh, family is the bulla, the attachment organ that it uses right here. This is how it attaches to the fish itself and, and stays attached pretty well. It's quite difficult to actually pull it off from the gill. As you can see, the parasite itself doesn't look very much like a copepod. It seems to lose quite a bit of segmentation through its development. So it's, it's, quite the, it's like a white blob on the, uh, on the gills. You'll see a picture of it later. So here is the life cycle of the, of the copepod. And I'll try to go through it all since many of you guys probably don't know what it is. So up here on the top, I'll start as, a, as an adult. Here it is attached to the fish. The adult has the egg sac, the adult female has the egg sac, which, it, which detaches off from the adult after about 20 to 32 days while being attached to the, the adult female. And then comes down here where it hatches and has about 48 hours to find and attach to a fish during its copepodid stage in order to survive. After that 48 hours, it usually dies off. And then it molts after about 24 hours, and then over here to the left, you see the, the life cycle and the molt of the adult male, and then to the right, it's the adult female. Now, the adult male is about one-tenth of the size of the female. So, it usually, about 100 hours in, attaches to the female, um, fertilizes the female, and then detaches, and then just dies off, and then the female uses its attachment to move up to the gills, find a nice spot, and attach, and then um, grow rates. Here is the native range of the of the parasite and the host itself. Here's a picture of the rainbow trout, the chinook salmon, and the coho all attached with the parasite over here. However, this parasite has been documented to be a, have uh, migrated, um, been introduced eastward through the introduction of the fish themselves. In the native range, Salmon Cola californiensis attaches to the, or is uh, prevalent in about 35% of the, of the examined steelhead, about 33% of the Chinook, and less than two out of a thousand, or two out of a thousand of the cohos are infected. Now the thing about Salmon Cola californiensis is what it does to the gills. So as you can see here, you have the normal gill filaments right here, and on this side, and then where it attaches right here, you see uh, a hindrance of the growth. And right here, there's, there's, you can't see it in this picture, but it causes clubbing on the gills, and the attachment site itself is a, is a gateway for a secondary bacterial infection, fungal infections. Also, the fish's immune response to this parasite is to produce more mucus, which it actually likes, because that's what it's gonna be feeding on. That's what the thought is. And the increase in mucus reduces the ability of the gills to actually respirate the oxygen in the water. Some environmental factors that could play a role in this is um, during seasonal droughts and stuff like that, the, the water column is reduced, so the, the amount of fish, the temperature is a little warmer, it's a little bit better for the parasite itself, the fish are closer together, and then you'll see an increase in the intensity of the infections at times. How my study began, um, as many of you guys know, Pacific salmon were introduced as early as the mid-1800s, and then 
the, in the introduction, the stocking became a lot more prevalent in the uh, in 1900s. Um, accounts from about 2012 of this parasite right here, fishermen and fisheries managers were starting to see this parasite attached to the gills, wondering what it was. Um, as early as 2012, there was another study that back in 2013. As if you guys remember, in 2013, it was uh, unseasonably uh, hot conditions during the early spring, causing the water column to be reduced. And a paper in Wisconsin saw that in a similar species, Semicola edwardsii, that infect uh, the brook drought, that they were also seeing an increase in the, or the intensity of the infection. So here are the three fish in, in question again, the steelhead, the chinook, and the coho salmon. The focus of my study is in the eastern area of Lake Ontario in Oswego Harbor and uh, Mexico Point and at the Salmon River Fish Hatchery. That's the three places in which I collected fish. And the Salmon River Fish Hatchery was very helpful in allowing me to, catch, or, uh, to examine the fish there. Um, it was all taken during the direct take process where they would kill the fish anyway, so I was just able to salvage the fish that were dying, so I didn't personally have to kill any of the fish. And they were, very, very open about allowing me to be there and, and uh, examine fish, which was very helpful. Um, also, another way I was able to get fish was by fishing and going with the, and the charters were very helpful, my cousin was helpful, and I was able to do some fishing. That was a lot of fun. This research was <laughs> incredibly fun and is still fun. Um, but yeah, this guy right here was about a meter long, so it's the biggest fish I've ever caught. <laughs> So after, we, after I was able to get the fish, this is what I did with the fish. Uh, each fish was uh, examined, measured, and sexed, and we gave each one a unique specimen code. I did visual inspection of the gills because the copepod itself, as an adult female, is about one centimeter in length. This, unfortunately, this method, unfortunately, doesn't get all the parasites because if there was a male attached or a, uh, or a female that wasn't fully developed, just not visible for me to the eye. So the, all the numbers from my results are from the minimal side. There could have been more. I only check the gills. Sometimes the parasite will attach to the fins and make their way up to the gills as well. Um, but for this study, I only looked at the gills themselves and the, and the operculum. Um, and then a subset of the copepods that I uh, um, took from the fish, I sent to collaborators and, and made slides. So right here is the result of the steelhead. The steelhead, 42 of the 61 steelhead I examined were affected, which is 69%. Um, the average in intensity was just under three copepods per fish, with the maximum, the most copepods I saw on a fish was 14 on a gill. For the Chinook, 87 of the 223 were infected, which is about 39%. Um, about one and a half copepods per fish on that, so a little bit less and with the maximum intensity only being five on those ones right there, and there's only one of that. The cohos, not a single one was uh, found on the 100 cohos I looked at, but that's to be expected because in the native range, only two out of a thousand are uh, infect have been found to be infected, so, and I didn't really want to look at a thousand cohos, so, for two parasites. All right, so here is a beautiful chart of what you have compared the, comparing the native range compared to Lake Ontario. And you see the Chinook numbers here at the bottom will start there. They're about the same. The intensity in the native range is a little is about one copepod more. But here in the steelhead, you have about a 35% prevalence of the parasite with an intensity of about three per fish. And then in Lake Ontario, it's close to 70%, almost double with an intensity just less, so like that's a, that's a little bit of a concerning number right there, is that 69%. So some conclusions I can make about this is, the, again, the, the results of the data show a higher prevalence in infection in the steelhead salmon. This is potentially because of the way that the steelhead behave, not to speculate wildly, but the steelhead like to spend more time in the stream, allowing for the parasite to be able to reinfect the host when the parasite does detach the eggs, it completely leaves the fish, but if you're in close proximity to other um, hosts dropping off those eggs as well, you're more likely to be infected. Um, higher prevalence of infection in steel can be a concern, even though intensity is a little bit less, because there is environmental factors that could play a role in increasing the uh, intensity of the fish.
Other factors that can influence the impact is the diet of the fish that we have here in Lake Ontario. They do like to feast on alewife, and as many of you guys know, alewife aren't the most nutritionally well-balanced meal for these fish. So uh, certain deficiencies in, in, uh, in vitamins such as thiamine could play a role in the fish's immune ability to repel said parasite. My future directions, um, I am going to be doing some more sampling in Lake Ontario and hopefully get some young of year because this parasite is able to infect young hosts as well because the total lifespan of the parasite is about two months from egg to adult female that's reproducing. So it's, it needs to be able to be able to infect uh, young of year fish. It needs to be able to find fish in about 100 meters of water as well because it, it sheds from the fish and then the eggs rest on the substrate and are able to somehow hatch and within 48 hours find a fish. It's kind of baffling to me, but it finds a way. Um, and then I also want to expand to Lake Erie because I hear they have quite the steelhead fishery out there and um, I'm curious to, to see what the numbers for steelhead are compared to the steelhead here in Lake Ontario because if it's that great and there's that many fish in the stream, there's a chance that the intensity of the parasite itself is quite high. So. Um, yeah, and then I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people. There's a lot of people out there that have helped me get fish, especially the San River Fish Hatchery, uh, the local fishermen and charters, and then I have funding from SUNY Oneonta and the use of the field station there. And that's it.